this week I had the opportunity to sit and talk with some people I hadn't seen in years, with some uh, relatively new acquaintances. It was kind of interesting because most of, most of my conversations, you know, when you have a one-track mind, they mostly go to the same direction. God and the how-tos. How do you do it? So it's kind of interesting. I gleaned from a multiplicity of conversations. One person asked me uh, something I think that we all go through depending on where we're at, which is um, what to do when we're confused. You know, as I said, I preach and teach what I believe to be real Christianity and what we really go through. And yes, people of God can get confused and they can get off the path. And, you know, it's not just a sob story one after another, but we are, when we say a persecuted people, we go through a lot. And I would not, if I was in your place, I would not want to be listening to somebody who told you they never went through anything. I'd run. <laughs> I don't want to be around somebody. I mean, that's, that was really the, the, the hallmark of Dr. Scott's ministry, was here was a person who lived through so much, and before your eyes came to you, and when things weren't so good, he told you, and things weren't so good, and you, you discerning ones could tell some things were broken inside or weren't working as well as they should. He still came and he preached to you, and he lived that faith. So I find myself in the same place. There's times when I'm at those crossroads. And interestingly enough, through the week, I met enough people asking me the same questions that periodically I've asked myself. You know, just when you think you're going along and everything's good, and then somehow you look and you see that you're not as close to where you were with God as you... Anybody been there? You're not as close as you thought you were. You thought you were way closer with God. You thought as you were walking, you were holding His hand. And you were walking along. Suddenly you look and there's, there's nothing there. Now, to me, that's the reality of our faith. And I've said to you many times, there are things that we have made the uh, focal point to go back to again and again, those faith handles when we say Paul's declaration of 2 Corinthians 1.20, all the promises in this book are ours to claim, and the only criteria is that you be in Christ Jesus. The whole book, 66 books, everything in there is yours to claim. That gives you the license if you're in Christ. And we've said this before, how do you get Christ in you? Christ is formed in your heart by faith. So I'm going to take you somewhere that You've been a thousand times. Maybe if you've been in this church, you've been here so often. I'm going to take you to Deuteronomy 33. You know it all so well, the Song of Asher. But I want you to take a little bit different look today for some reason. While you're turning there, I'm not a big Proverbs person, but I found a, a proverb that fit the bill. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. That's pretty good wisdom. Now, while you're turning to Deuteronomy 33, I want to say a few things. I want to say first, contrary to what some people think, I just, I, I want you to get to the place where I'm at in my mind today mentally. Life is not easy for me. You know, people see me and I'm smiling and laughing. Life is not easy for me. I think I'm, I'm just like you. We struggle. We struggle. And every day is a battle. Now, if that's not your portion, I'm sorry and the message isn't for you. But I have a battle every day. I think sometimes I tell God, if you just, just take the pressure, you know me, here it goes. 
you could just take the pressure off just a little bit. You know, I look at you as a congregation, and I'm not sure that some of you, even after all these years, understand what the battle is about. It would be so easy, and some of you know what I'm saying is true, because some of you were even tempted to do it, to take your hand off the plow and go. The battle here is always intense. There's, it seems like there's never any let up. We go from one to another, and there is no let up. Will, will we get it in our heads? And here I go, I'm, I'm, I'm starting at ground zero, guys, and I'm aiming for a direction because I intend to preach myself out of this. And if you're along in that mindset, I'm, I'm intending to take you with me, which is at some point, there's got to be something that you grab hold of that gets you out of that pit. Somebody asked me this week, how do I get peace? Now, you want, you want the carnal answer? How <laughs> would you like the spiritual answer? Because the carnal answer was, well, first thing, go and buy yourself some of those noise-canceling headphones. That's the first step to peace. <laughs> Second step is get rid of all the people in your life that just bother the liver out of you. Just get them out of your life. Now, I'm giving you the carnal answer first. Just get rid of them. If it's toxic, dump it. But if you want the spiritual answer, you're only going to get one. The only way for you and I to have peace is to look to the Word of God and to understand what has been given to us in that realm through Christ. That's the starting point. I'm sorry, beyond that, you're not going to get that, you know, there's this contradiction. Jesus said, my peace I give to you. And he also said, in the world you'll have tribulation, which means something that he has given to me will enable me to have that which he has promised. And at the same time, paradoxically, I will be in turmoil. I will have tribulation. There's going to be something going on because he gave it almost at the same time. These words I'm telling you. So there's only one way to have peace. And then there's this other factor over here. For me, I have peace when I recognize that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be. And that's taken me many years to finally acknowledge and say, yes, this is where I'm supposed to be. There's not some other thing I'm supposed to do. But at the same time, I do recognize, and this is the battle, here comes the battle part of this. You always think, maybe outside of the realm of where I am, there is more for me to do. Maybe, in my case, it's ambition. For somebody else, it may be the temptation to find something more challenging. I don't, by the way, I don't need anything more challenging than what I have here. That's not my issue. So what I'm saying to you is I have sifted this down to at least an understanding of one thing. The promises that I've been given, Paul refers to in Corinthians. He says, the God of all comfort. And I would also say the God of all peace. So there's got to be the point of departure where you are finding your peace with God. And for today, I'm going to take you into this word because I think there is great uh, comfort in this, but there's great peace when we finally recognize something beyond what we've read a thousand times here in this Song of Asher. You know, I went through the 33rd chapter of Deuteronomy, and I put some notations because Moses blesses. These are the blessings before he dies, and I put in my margin, as I went through the whole chapter, um, I put in some footnotes that, for example, in the first few verses is the fact of God's love. And then we'll say, for example, we have here to, to Reuben, we have the inevitability, inevitability of conflict to Levi and that group there, the priority of service to Benjamin, the assurance of support. I went through and I itemized all of these. And when I got to Dan Forward, I thought, 
Here's quite interesting, the guarantee of help. I want to be in that group today because I need the guarantee of help. Now, you don't have to wrestle God to get his help. I'm telling you, this part of this promise which I have and you have lived in for a long time requires only one thing, that when we understand we need help, whether your issue is peace, whatever is going on in your life, I'm disquieted a little bit today myself and kind of at bottom, you've got to be looking to him completely. I've said this before, only when you become completely empty of your resources to do for yourself, then God will go to work. You know, I think sometimes we're still trying to find the practical way, like that person that asked about peace. Let me still try and do a little bit on my own, and you will never achieve the peace that God promises while you're still trying to fix it on your own, because if there is a measure left of you doing it, God cannot get the glory. You cannot look Godward afterwards and say, when I was empty and broken, Lord, you filled me up. When I didn't think I could get up this morning out of bed, you got me up. So, I love this passage even more today than the many times I've read it before. So, here is Moses blessing, and of course, the song of Asher. And I want to start at verse 24. And of Asher, he said, let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren, and let him dip his foot in oil. And the reason why I wanted to start there is because we always go to thy shoes be of iron and brass, and we leave out something. If you look on a map, the territory assigned to Asher, which would comprise of what is maybe perhaps today modern-day Lebanon, and that very rocky terrain, so from, from the sea all the way up to the foothills, but it's very rocky terrain that was assigned to Asher in today what is Lebanon, and in today what comprises of about 45% of fruit and olive production in their whole uh, growing area that they have available for agriculture. 45% is fruit and olive. But in Asher's day, there would have been a lot more olive. And I, I don't think it's an error, by the way. Everybody likes to say, let him dip his foot in oil. The Hebrew reads, let him bathe his foot in oil. I don't think it's an accident that that territory assigned to him is a territory full of olives. And you might say, what does that have to do with dipping his foot in oil? Well, it takes, because the promise is going to go on to give him some tough shoes, iron and brass shoes. And I think those iron and brass shoes have a lot to do with the uh, foot being dipped or bathed in oil. You know, we pass by this, we're so familiar, but I want, I want you to get something that I gleaned out of this, which is if that territory, which is rough and uh, kind of dangerous, assigned to Asher, has the agriculture and had it in Asher's day as well, then I don't think it's too far of a stretch to say that uh, there may have been an allusion to the fact that what Asher's, uh, perhaps his vocation or what he may have done in his calling pertaining to that, with his foot being bathed in oil and, and these shoes of iron and brass, uh, it seems pretty logical that there is a rough terrain, and we've coined it here, Dr. Scott did, he called it tough shoes for a tough trip. But I said, you know, there's more to these shoes than just the trip itself, because assigned to Asher and his territory, let him dip his foot in oil, and it makes perfect sense that that could be an allusion to the work done in that land that was given to him, then it makes perfect sense for us to look at the fact that not only do we, as we claim this promise, say, tough shoes given to us if we're going to claim the promise, tough shoes in the place that we're given to walk, in the place that we're given to work, in what we have been 
allotted to do here in the time we've been given to do it. You know, a lot of, a lot of times we read through something and it, it kind of makes sense. I've heard people say, let him dip his foot in oil means that he's going to be anointed. Well, that can mean that. And oil in, in the scripture always refers to the Holy Spirit. We could say, let the person being blessed of God, let them go and be anointed by the Holy Spirit. Well, that's if you're a Christian and you're in Christ and Christ is in you, then the promise of what the Father has been given to us, that we have the Spirit, which means as you walk, as you go, you are definitely walking anointedly, if you want to make up a, a phrase. But I reread this and I thought, you know, beyond this picture, because um, we always jump to this, we always say, here, thy shoes will be iron and brass. And everyone here knows this message to be what? Tough shoes for a tough trip. Well, I agree with that. That's a good statement. But let me backtrack. And this is what I want you to add if you haven't already added it in here. Which is this life is not one of uh, playtime, contrary to what some people preach. If I'm taking license with this and saying, if what was assigned to Asher, let him be acceptable to his brethren and let him dip his foot in oil. And if that concept is referring to what work Asher was assigned, I'm also taking it as what to what work we are assigned. And that equipping, proper equipping, is needed for the assignment down here. Now, Paul says it in the New Testament, feet shod with the gospel of peace. You know, when you think about it, God kind of repeats certain things over and over again. In fact, I remember listening to Dr. Scott for the first time deliver this message and say, tough shoes for a tough trip, but I was just starting out. And my trip wasn't that hard. So I didn't know what, what he was saying when he kept saying, we're going to need tough shoes for the trip. Now that I'm a little bit older and I've worn out a couple of pair of shoes, spiritually, I get it. You know, what this verse, I came back to this, what this verse said to me afresh was God's provision. If God has assigned me and assigned you to something, God has also provided. He's given us the information and the tools to be able to make it. And I think, certainly because I said to you, every day is a struggle. People see me and they encounter me and I'm, I'm always the one lifting up and telling people how God will help you if you'll turn to Him. And it seems like nobody ever recognizes it's still a struggle for me. I haven't yet arrived. I haven't been completed yet. I'm maybe one of the few pastors standing in the pulpit telling you I'm still a work in progress. God's still got a lot of stuff to do with me. And for me, hopefully, <laughs> by the time I'm done today, we'll be a little bit closer to saying, I'm still being worked on. But sometimes I feel like it's been a work that's stopped for a little while. I get the feeling like, you know, God started this thing over here, and then God decided to go somewhere else, and I've got this sign saying, you know, right lane closed. I'm like Caltrans, <laughs> and it's been closed for a long time, and nothing's going on. Hello? <laughs> so, God's provision. Now, I've said this to you before in the last few weeks. God knows exactly what we need. But I figure today God knows even more what we need. Coming back to this wonderful word of promise. Now, some of the translations read differently. I had to, of course, because of my Hebrew and I've got a Hebrew group that I'm sure is going to want to look at this when we get together and do our Hebrew studies, but I had to look at this afresh just to make sure, and it's kind of interesting because the word for um, iron specifically, interestingly enough in the Hebrew is, do you remember there was a strong man in the Bible named Barzillai, that man of iron, strong man? Well, that's from that same root, so I figured we weren't too far here in the brass equation or in the iron equation. And brass, interestingly enough, is from the same root where we get the word for Nehushtan. That, remember they made that serpent out of bronze and 
same root word, and I thought, kind of interesting, because not only are these shoes tough, but they're fortified. The idea, you know, when we read the Hebrew, as I've said in teaching Hebrew, is that Hebrew can be ambiguous. We have to sometimes fill in the blanks. And in translating this, I know why there's a lot of italics. Some of the translations, if you have a 26 translation, read, may your bars be, or your bars will be iron and brass. And it doesn't say shoes. But when you look up the word, it's shoes, it's anything for support underneath. And some of the translations, including my Bible, say, under thy shoes shall be iron. And I looked up one of the giants, I think it was Spurgeon, that said, uh, if one were to translate that under your shoes would be iron, then also the promised Asher would have been given as if to say, resources will be under your feet, provision and resources under your feet. And I said, well, even though I've not come to know it that way, that's still not bad to say that if God gives me the proper shoes and I put them on because I'm on a tough trip, he'll also give me the provision under my feet to get me to where I got to go. And then my mind immediately went back to Asher and his rough territory. And I thought, you know, my life hasn't been easy, and I'm sure many of you are just like me. It seems like we're constantly climbing uphill. And as I said in the last few weeks, we may get to the mountaintop periodically, but we don't stay there. I referenced last week, Psalm 84, that we're on this pilgrimage. You don't stay put. And if you're walking in God's plan, you're constantly going through things. It's not always the same. You know, somebody said, is it always the same problems? Is it always? No. And you think, you've seen it all. I've seen it all in ministry now, and here comes a new one. You know, God, you're either really, really, really creative, or Satan is really, really creative, but I, I'm not sure who's more creative, but I didn't, I've never seen that one before. Or I didn't see that one coming. Who could imagine? I'd wake up this morning. I still don't have any feeling in this. I can move it. I don't have any feeling. Who would believe that? And I was thinking, well, maybe it's just a pinched nerve until it started to move down here. I went to bed last night, and I was fine. That's why I quoted Proverbs 27.1. Who knows about tomorrow? Please, don't tell me about tomorrow. I'm thinking about right now. <laughs> I remember when Dr. Scott taught on this message, and he'd get to the place of, of days, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. And he used to say, don't worry about tomorrow's problems. How many of you were worrying about tomorrow's problems? What? Now it's today. How many were worrying about tomorrow, and now it's today? Are you still as worried as you were yesterday, when it's today? Trust me, tomorrow will come, but when you go to bed at night, you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. That's why I love this. I don't know about tomorrow, really. <laughs> That's a true statement now. I just know who holds tomorrow, and I know supposedly he's there tomorrow. He's there now and tomorrow. I spend most of my time like you. I go back to these promises. So I want to talk about provision first, because the shoes of iron and brass say tough shoes for a tough trip, but I don't want this to be 1,001 times that you've heard this. I want you to put some fresh ideas under this. We, there's nothing new in this book, but I want you to put some fresh ideas. I put in my margin travel shoes because these would not necessarily be the shoes if Asher was going to have a vacation that he would get to go on vacation. I put travel shoes for roots of difficulty. And then I thought, that's it. That describes me in a nutshell. I go on these paths. I think, I think, I forget. God's the boss. He put me here. You know, we can forget sometimes. God put us here. We think we begin to climb up and go on these difficult roads. And then I recognize God gave me the provision to be able to face and tackle the climb. Even a professional mountain climber, someone who's going to go rock climbing, even the most amateur rock climber goes out and gets the equipment necessary even for just the small climb. 
even when you go to those places where they have the indoor, you still have to put on certain gear. So why would it be we wouldn't have this in the spiritual realm as well? God's provision for the traveling pilgrim, which is you and me. I also put here fighting shoes. Because that seems to be another way to say what my pathway has been. It's been a battle. It's been a battle. I'm looking back there, right there at you. It's been a battle. And some of you, I know you have battles. It's a battle. And for some of us, it's more of a battle than others. I'm, I'm looking right back, right at you over there, and I know the battle you have. It's a, it's a daily battle. Just to keep your household together. Just to be able to juggle work and all the things you've got to do just to stay afloat. And beneath that I put like a military person. You know, you, you join the army. Now today it's a little bit different. You, some of the people have to go and buy some of their things, if you can even believe that. But back when the military was still doing its part to provide for all of the people who were in the military, you'd get certain things assigned to you. That was part of your equipment. This is part of your equipment. Shoes strong enough for the trip. Now, I can tell you something. This message probably never mattered to me as much as today, at this moment, because I realize that even though I feel tired and I feel like the battle is, will the battle ever give up, I recognize that without the provision that God has given to make the trip, I couldn't make it at all. I wouldn't be here without the provision he's already given. And most of you, it's the same thing. You would have, you would have fallen away a long time ago. And the things that you thought you could not make it through now, looking back some of you over the last 10, 20, or 30 years, you go, no, God, God gave me the resources. I had, to, I had to put those resources on. I had to put them into practice. I had to use them. And we start out and we hear about the resources. We may not be using them. The other one that I put regarding these marvelous shoes, yes, yeah, called them marvelous. Shoes for perseverance and protection. I like perseverance personally. It means when I get a little tired, I know the provision that God gave me in those shoes. They'll take me the distance. They'll take me the distance. Now, if this gracious promise isn't enough, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Now, we've got a promise of provision, and I want you to put something in your margin, please. I'm going to try and write with this hand. So uh, you don't have to read Hebrew too much. I, I'll put it here, and then especially for my Hebrew class, but uh, for you who, who do not read or write Hebrew, it's okay if you want to put this in your margin. You can do it, and if not, this is the word, by the way, for strength. And what's interesting, this is symbol for yours, you, you or yours. And what's interesting about this is that this word for strength, if you were to look it up, there are other words in Hebrew for strength. There's strength that comes from God. We've got all kinds of different words in the Hebrew, but this particular one is somewhat interesting because if you were to look it up, it carries three concepts with it. You're not going to believe this because as, as long as I've read this, I've always thought, as thy days, so shall thy strength be days and strength, and they're proportionate. But I want you to put beside the word strength somewhere in your margin, I want you to put the first word, because the Hebrew, in the Hebrew lexicon, if you were to look this up, you'd see three words that describe this word for strength. The first one is rest. I'm giving you the English word. I don't think you want me to give you a Hebrew lesson. So, as your days, it just seems strange. Can you say that? As your days, so shall your rest be? Well, if you were reading the Hebrew, you'd glean that out of the word for strength. It's part of the word for strength. As your days, yours. You for you and me for me. And I put 
the word rest in my margin because A, it signifies that as one of three words. But you know, when Jesus said, for those that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me and I'll give you rest, I want you to put that concept right in there. See, the Old and the New Testament kind of, they come together so synergistically in these concepts. And the days when you feel you cannot go another mile, I want you to remember that the word, the Hebrew word for strength, comprises also of God's rest that he's given you. That is the ability for you to take refuge and rest in him. I know the years you've, you've, you've studied this and you've memorized. As thy days, so shall thy strength be thinking. If you wake up in the morning and you don't feel that strong, you know your day's not going to be that bad and you can kind of kick back. And if you wake up in the morning and you feel like Zorro ready to tackle the world, look out. Yes, it means that too in the secondary meaning. I'm giving you the three, because there's three. So rest being the fact that no matter what your day is like, you can always have or take rest in him. As your day is, so shall your ability, if you will, to have refuge, or repose, or rest in him. Because this is the promise, by the way, as I said the first, 2 Corinthians 1.20, all the promises that are in him, that is in Christ Jesus. So I'm defining. Second one is just regular strength, not strength that comes from God or muscular strength, just, there, it's just a word in the Hebrew, just plain old strength. So yes, as your day, if you woke up today and you didn't feel that good, if you woke up sick, probably your day will be a little quieter. Now I have had days, by the way, where I woke up and I was ready to tackle the world. In fact, somebody sent me, you know, there's these things that you can go on the internet and they're like uh, pictures with captions. And one that was sent to me was something like, um, I think it was, when her feet hit the ground, be, be like uh, the woman that when her feet hit the ground, Satan says, oh bleep, she's up. <laughs> but. I've had days like that, and I don't like those days. I don't like those days because I know when I get up feeling like that, there's going to be some gargantuan stuff hit the fan, and I'm not too happy about that because, you know, really, I'm one of those people that could settle for just, you know, smooth sailing. Please don't rock the boat if you can avoid it. No, no. So you know when you have those days, yes, this is exactly what that means. When you wake up with that type of vim and vigor, you better look out because it's going to be a tumultuous day, most likely. You better be prepared for it. You better put on the whole armor of God and expect stuff is going to come your way. And if, if you haven't been a Christian that long, if you're listening for the first time, you're saying, what is she talking about? Stick around for a while. <laughs> There's nothing like personal experience. <laughs> See, I do believe that I could tell you about my experience, but it would not help you to understand. These are why subjective testimonies don't work. Wait a little while. You'll know what I'm saying because you'll come to the gnosis of it yourself. Thank you. Lastly, that word for strength, if you were looking in the lexicon, you'd also read it says rest, strength, and the ability to bear or to forbear. And I want you to remember these three words because they really added a dimension for me. I've always claimed this is just simply as my days and as my days are, as thy days are, I'm speaking for me, you for you, so shall my strength be. But I'm also thinking about what I'm able to bear and I think about the scripture that says God won't give you more than you can handle. That was the first book of Scott. He won't tempt you beyond what you're able. And I've told you many times, I think God thinks I'm really, really able. <laughs> Have you considered my servant Melissa down there? She's really able. <laughs> really, really, really able. You ever felt like that? Like God thinks 
you're really, really able to handle this. No, you're not just really, really. You're exceptionally really able to handle this. So it gives you a heavier load. Now I can make fun of that or I can say picture yourself if you are a microcosm of and living as a Christian, then look at Christ. And you think about what was, what was he not able to bear when he went to the cross and the shame and the reproach and the concept of death and dying. This is why he prayed, let this cup pass from me. But he was there to do the will of the Father. Now, I know what happens when I get into this and I'm starting to feel just a little bit lighter in spirit and I think, yes, with this type of a day that God has given me, he's also going to give me the ability to bear whatever comes my way. And I'm not speaking of stoicism. I'm speaking of if he's given me the proper equipment and I know it's the proper equipment, then there isn't anything coming my way I'm not able to handle. That's a good way of saying it. There's nothing coming my way that God hasn't provided for me and for you to be able to handle. That's the provision in the promise. So, we're given this provision and strength. Now read with me in verse 26, because this is kind of interesting. There's none like unto the God of Jeshurun. I think this is kind of funny, because Jeshurun is really kind of a, a pet name. The best way I can explain this is, you know, when you talk to your wife or your girlfriend, you say lovey or muffin or baby doll or something. Well, Jeshurun's just like that. It's kind of like a pet name. We seldom explain this, but Jeshurun, there's none like under the God of Jeshua. It's kind of like a pet name. It's a kind name. It means something else, but I'm trying to give you the, the idea without going into a heavy detail. Who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and in his excellency on the sky. I always think that verse really to me is that God is everywhere, and he's always there to help. That's why I said the guarantee of help beginning at verse 22, and I say the guarantee because of the beauty of what's in here. And then, of course, probably one of my favorite passages, verse 27, the eternal God, this is God's care, is thy refuge. Now, no one could explain this better, by the way. I can't go by this without referencing the way Dr. Scott explained this when he explained eternal God. And do you remember he used to talk about the parade? The first time I heard that <laughs> eternal God in the parade, I, he lost me. I was thinking, yeah, we better get better, 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 okay. But now I get it. You know, he used to think, he used to say, you know, time and space, that's related to us. And with God, there's no time. So, when he would reference the eternal God, it, it, it now makes perfect sense. He'd say, picture the parade, you know, the Rose Bowl parade. And, and in fact, I wish when the first time when he would have said it, he would have said, you know that the route that the parade, the Rose Bowl goes on, that's a fixed, that's a fixed line. There's no deviating from that. They've determined where they're going to go, and that's the path. And if you're sitting watching the parade, as you watch the first part of the parade go by, what was coming up that was at the front, that is now passed you by, is past, and what's yet to come, that which has not passed you by yet, is yet to happen. Now, I remember when he explained this. I wish I would have understood that completely back then. We're so busy worrying about what we think, how we perceive time. We're so busy worrying about the things that we think are coming up that are really in reality already passed with God, say, leading the parade and he's at the front, he's at the forefront leading, and this parade is now passing us by. The things that we were most worried about are already passed. It's the things that are yet coming up that are not yet realized, and we can say with certainty we know that if the leader is following the path and is not deviated from this parade of time, then we can be certain about the outcome of where the end, which has not yet happened, which is the past that will become future when it passes by, we know the course it's on. Now, see, if it was that simple? <laughs> <laughs> but what I love about this idea is that when it became clear to me 
that the things that I was so worried about and so disturbed about were already considered past and done. And the things that were yet to come that hadn't yet been brought to fruition, if the one who is the Alpha and the Omega, who is leading this grand parade, has already ensured that this is the path that it's going on, then I can be certain that what is not yet past will actually be guided by the same one who led at the forefront. Essentially, God's on the corner before you get there. That's, pretty, that's a simple way of saying it. But more importantly is that if this, if this parade passing through, which let's just say is my life now, which has been a parade sometime, <laughs> except I don't have all the flowers and petals and things like that, but if my life is a parade, if your life, if you're part of the parade, maybe you're just a, you think you're a spectator in your parade. <laughs> But you can be sure that how this grand procession is going, the things that you thought were impossible, that you were nervous about, that you weren't sure about, the one who was leading has already brought by the guarantee. Now, the idea is stay, stay on the pathway here with me. If God is on the corner before you get there, then the provision that he's promised, the rest, the strength and the ability for you to, to bear, he's guaranteed. It requires, by the way, only one thing, that you stay connected in faith, but I love the fact, God's care, that the eternal God is thy refuge. I love the idea, because this is what made me come here today in this passage. It is when I run out of hiding places myself. It is when I finally figure out, you know, God's going to be there to take care of me. God has not abandoned me. God is still there. He gave me the equipping, which sometimes I feel like, as I said, it's either the construction that started and we're still somewhere underway, but God took a break for a little while and he left me with the orange signs, or he gave me these, he gave me these shoes to walk with, but now I've, I'm lost. And that will hit you in a few minutes. This is a real thing I'm saying to you. We think we're, I start off by saying, we think we're walking with God. We think we're on the pathway. I'm holding his hand. He, he, he's leading me. He guides me. Then you, you, you kind of turn around. You don't realize maybe the distance that I felt isn't imaginary. Maybe I'm not as close. And I still have this equipment that I have, but maybe, maybe now I'm, I've lost my spiritual GPS and you've got to come back and take a new fix. I'm preaching reality to you because I wouldn't want to be here trying to tell you some funny land, imaginary, fuzzy, feel-good something that has no value. And I'm a real person with real struggles just like you, and you work them out by faith. You come back to the book, you come back to these things, and you understand, wait a minute, God's on the corner. God, God has already seen my wrong turns. He actually saw when I was tempted to take the provision off because, oh, who needs this? I, I'm good. <laughs> you ever been there? Yeah. Oh, three of you. <laughs> I'm good. I love what Spurgeon said. He said, this promise is like trying to see stars. You cannot see them in daylight. You will only see the magnitude of the stars in the sky when deep darkness falls and when all other lights have been extinguished. And it's very profound as if to say you will not understand this promise. It will not have any meaning to you if you have not felt the dimness or even an extinguishing of the light in your life. So here we have the God of the forefront is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. I love that other translation too, underneath bottomless. OK, you've heard this before. How far is bottomless? <laughs> and you can't answer even now after 25, 35 years. Now, I'm curious to know how many of you have ever been in that, what I'll call the, the free-falling mode. 
I have. I've been in that free-falling mode. And I've always thought of this. And how far, how far is it on the way down? I remember thinking and kind of making a caricature in my mind, just like, uh, you know, when Lois Lane was falling off the building and here comes Superman and, you know, I don't know, he had time to smoke a cigarette or polish his toes or something before he swoops down and catches her before she splats on the ground. It's not like that. Our lives are not Hollywood movies with the ability to manipulate somehow. And in the free fall, you know when you're going down, you just you can't figure out how you're going to stop it. And sometimes you can't stop it. I remember talking with a person here in the congregation who seemingly it just, there was not a word of consolation that I could give to stop the fall. And as hard as I tried and as much as I tried and prayed and asked God, could not stop this person from falling. And then it became clear to me, this person will have to fall very, very far and maybe very hard and maybe even the bottomless concept for this person, maybe God will be there with arms but just before the bottom. In other words, pretty close to hitting rock bottom right there. Now, I don't care what the cause of the fall part is. I don't think God does either. You know, we can sit and we can rationalize, well, what, what was it that made me fall down? What was the one thing that brought me to this point where I feel like I can't get up again? And then you realize it doesn't matter what it is. Satan has had the ability to talk to you either convince you that it's your fault and therefore God is just going to do this. While you're falling, God's going to go, whoosh, okay, bounce, baby, because I'm not going to be there. That's not the God we serve. And sometimes I think we go so crazy trying to analyze what it was. Did we... Did we offend God? Did we say something? I mean, that's a sensitive soul towards God. What did I do that I'm now in this place because I'd like to stop the fall and I'd like to stop the, that whole motor that seems to be going at full force? How do I get off this thing? Now, the beautiful part is that at some point when you come to the reality that you are indeed falling, you know the arms are there. You know that his arms are there. Now, I've taken a secondary meaning to this scripture as well because I fly and I go in planes and many times I'll say, and God's arms are underneath bottomless, 30,000 feet in the sky. But still, it doesn't matter how high or how low. And I think of Psalm 139 as I just uttered this to you, that no matter how high I go or how low I get, God's arms are there, underneath bottomless, which seems like an impossibility. How could that be? But his arms are there. And then I recognize when I come back to my sanity, God loves me. Just like he gave the people daily manna, just like he gave the people or to the widow and to the prophet oil, just as Jesus taught the disciples to pray for daily bread, he gives me enough sufficient for each day if I'll come back to the Word. And the beauty of this today, if you've been struggling, remind yourself that God gave you the provision even in your struggle. He didn't say, Child of God, no more struggle for you. Child of God, no more pain, no more issues. It's all settled. He just said, I'm going to give you this peace. I'm giving it to you. And at the same time, you're going to have a tough trip. I've given you the equipping to make it. Tough shoes for a tough trip. I've given you the strength, the rest, the ability to bear proportionate to, and by the way, proportionate to the days of your life and your living every single day. I'm giving you a gift for every single day to make it. You want to give up? 
Anybody here want to give up today? Yeah. Well, that was about 25% of you. Anybody wanted to give up last week? No. Well, I did. Yeah. I tricked you. Just for a little while, and then I came back to my sanity. It's a battle with me. The battle is this church. If the battle's not over this church, it's over the future of this church. And fussing about how difficult it is for some people to understand the life and death of this ministry. There's a world out there listening that's depending on this ministry while the local people, some of them just, you know, they got better things to do, disinterested. That challenges my whole way of thinking. How could that be? The lifeline, I'm sorry, I never told you I was perfect. I never told you anything about me except this is what I've come to know. If you'll trust God, he'll see you through. If you'll trust God, he'll give you provision. If you'll trust God, he'll make a way where there is no way. If only that. Why it's so hard for some people to come here and say, yeah, it's a tough message. Yeah, she's not coming to tell me how great I am today, or how lovely I look. You can know one thing. I love you so much as a church that I come to tell you the truth. I come to tell you that you better be putting on that whole armor, and you better be ready to fight, and you better be willing to listen if you've heard the message 2,000 times. It's a tough trip. You weren't promised ease. You know when you're promised ease? When you enter into that final rest, which is not a rest at all, but all of this training for a time when you will rule and reign with him in a different frame. No more, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more death. No more sickness, but until that time, take every single, every single piece of advice that God has given, provision, strength, the ability to understand that God has not put you here and said, here, you figure it out. Here's, here's the way. Here's what I've given you, sufficient for you to make the trip. Now, I'm looking back at the last week, the last month, I've had, I've had a tough ride. I've had months of insomnia. Never had a problem sleeping, folks. I'm the person that I'm talking to people on the phone at nighttime. It's 9 o'clock, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. <laughs> and I'm out. I've, I've been talking to people on the phone and falling asleep. And they have to wake me up. Hello? Hello? <laughs> I turn on the 10 o'clock news because I think I can stay up that late. I only heard 30 seconds of the daily breaking news and I went to sleep. And the TV is on very loud. I don't care because I'm asleep. That used to be me. Insomnia. And it's been going on. And I think, okay, you know, God, you're supposed to be there when I close my eyes. And if something is a distraction or my eyes are going to, you'll be there watching me while I sleep. And I think, well, you know, maybe God's taken off to do something else because he knows that I sleep pretty good. He's, he's gone off to do something else. <laughs> it seems like it's always something. And then I recognize when I come to my sanity, he's given me provision enough to make it through. And he's given me these things, by the way, because there's still work that needs to be worked on in me and things that need to be worked on in you. And the only way to make it through is to take these words of promise and say, okay, God's going to give me the strength enough or the rest enough or the, the ability to bear enough because he's given me the equipment. And he's there, his care for me. He, if he's on the corner before I get there, then he's also in my bedroom before I open my eyes at 2 o'clock in the morning when I can't sleep. Which is why I tell you, if you can't sleep, turn on the shortwave radio and listen to me or Dr. Scott. Just put it on for about 20 minutes. You'll go to sleep again. 
I can't listen to myself because what ha no, <laughs> because they'll play a program and then all of a sudden I, I'm starting to put myself to sleep. <laughs> then I say something really loud and I think I'm dreaming so I wake up. <gasps> See, I'm giving you all these inner secrets today so you can know I'm a real person and real people that have real problems go back to the book and they say, this is it. Now let me give you the, the silver lining on all this because if we're given these shoes for rough terrain, and I started with showing you if indeed it is him dipping or bathing his foot in oil, that is for his, his work, what he does. By the way, if he was really crushing olives I don't know that I'd want to wear those shoes afterwards. But that being said, with those tough shoes for a tough trip and with all the help and care and God on the corner before you get there and underneath bottomless are his everlasting arms, well, go to the very last verse of, uh, the last of verse 29 when it says, And thou shalt tread upon their high places. It's as if Moses, writing this down, put something in the past for the people, for the promise. Thou shalt tread upon their high places. Remember I said those shoes in a mountainous terrain for a tough climb. Here's kind of the capstone of the promise. Thou shalt tread upon their high places. This is not, um, this is not like groves or something. This is elevated really literally high places. You will tread upon those high places. Why? Because God has given you those tough shoes, provision for the trip. This is the capstone saying, we made it. This is the capstone saying, we will make it. If you're not there yet, then start with, I'm going to make it because I've got the equipment. But I hope you're beyond that and you say, no, God's word says, thou shalt tread upon their high places. That's where I'm going to get to. Now, it may take me a little while, and I was down a little bit, and I thought I was going to free fall, but the promise is also that I'm going to tread upon those high places because he's given me a way when I apparently thought there was no way. I'm on my way up the mountain. Enough time in the valley and enough time spent trying to fumble around figuring out how did I get here? Who cares how I got here? I'm climbing the mountain. You coming with me? Yes, sir. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com. Dot com.